your brain is different now that you've seen that one slide. I mean physically and literally different. Light has entered your eyeballs, passed through neural networks in the middle of your brain, onto visual circuits at the back of your brain, and then back up to the front of your brain, where for the first time it's perceived as conscious thought. There it interacts with other neural networks of memories, emotion, and executive function. And all along the way, the neurons in these pathways that have been activated because of that one slide build slightly stronger and better connections to each other because of that one slide. So what happens to your brain with the 11 hours a day you generally spend with technology? If you're the average American, you watch five hours a day of TV. You check your phone 200 times a day. You get lots of flash bulbs. <laughs> your car parks itself. Your phone checks its, uh, counts your steps. You use your computer to work and to connect with friends. The devices around you are increasingly connecting you and, the, and your brain to the rest of the world. What is that doing to your brain? Why do I care about this? As Nick pointed out, I, like many of you, have been responsible for creating a lot of this technology. First the internet, then the smartphone, then the internet of things. And even today, I'm hard at work on the technologies that should shape the next 10 years. And along the way, I've had a chance to work with a lot of really amazing technology experts at most of the big companies you're aware of. But I found myself wondering recently, when every public space I go to features flat screens at the wall, on the wall, and people entranced by them, and every stop sign I come to, people checking their phones, I ask these basic questions. What makes us want to engage with technology the way that we do? Pretty basic question, right? I also have daughters. So a typical situation, you know, is I'm trying to figure out how to raise daughters in an ever-changing technology world. I'll walk in and see them doing their homework. Great, but the TV's on, the laptops are up and they're playing Minecraft, and their smartphones are next to them receiving continual messages from their friends. We all know what to do, right? We're good parents. Turn the TV off, go downstairs, do your homework, and go outside and play. That's what our parents told us. We know that that works. But what if the world that they're going to grow up in is different than the world that we grow up in? What if the skills that they're going to need are different than the skills that we're going to need? What's the future that I'm pushing them out into, and what do I need to be explaining to them? So that's what I set out to do, a three-year journey of reading hundreds of books to try and understand not only where we're at now, but where we're trying to go. I really wanted to read the book that gave me the answer, but I couldn't find it. And the reason why was because I started to find that the questions I, I was interested in led to other questions. I don't know if you've ever worked on a project like this. Um, a good example is if you read about books about texting while driving or what the internet is doing to your brain, you'll find experts that talk about top-down and bottom-up attentional networks, the primacy of V1 and V2 visual circuits in your brain, dopamine, everybody wants to talk about dopamine. But then all of those authors will pretty soon make a statement, something like, and your brain is hardwired to X, Y, Z, or you evolved to respond to a certain stimuli in a certain way. So I got curious and I wanted to figure out where that literature was. So now we go from modern psychology back to our paleo ancestors, fields called evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. Completely different discipline, different, different evidence, different um, theoretical models. But when you read through that, eventually you find that those authors too make basic statements to, we inherited some of these skills from our ancestors prior to these guys, like the great apes, tool use, cultural intelligence, the ability to work in small groups. And if you go back even further, you find that the primatologists that I've spoken to all around the world resort to basic animal behaviors, the fact that we grew up in predatory environments. In fact, I'll challenge you to think about the trending technology, whether it's Netflix trending now, social media, or Facebook. If you look at what's trending now, it's not that much different than what I find and drives animal behavior, the four Fs. We know what those are? Feeding, fighting, fleeing, and fornicating, <laughs> right? OK, so I went back through the past, and I went back through this literature. What I'm going to do is try and share with you in the next few minutes a few of the insights that I got out of a, a three-year journey, saving you having to read all those thousands of scholarly articles and my boring 500-page book on the topic. Um, I hope that you'll find that there are some insights from the past that are going to inform the future. But the first one is that the idea of evolution is not a simple one. 
We do not think the way we do because of some single factor. This is not opposable thumbs or, as Nick likes to say, fire. This is a complicated picture. We had writing, which definitely changed our brains. We had the advent of agriculture, which changed evolution. That was only 40,000 years ago. Symbolic art, the, the ability to represent visual images and, and transfer that to the world around us was only 70,000 years ago. Large brains, large brains only co-evolved after we had food that we could cook that provided the calories for lar large brains. What we have is a steady progress of evolutionary steps if you take any one of those out of the puzzle, we don't end up thinking like we do today. That's not the insight I want to share with you. I went through this exhaustively, and I found 50 different factors. And if you took one of them out, we wouldn't think the way we do today. Here's what's scary. And unless you go through modern psychology, evolutionary psychology, primatology, and animal behavior, I'd argue you don't see that everything has changed in the last 100 years. I'll give you a simple example with the apple here. In the last 100 years, most of the f 100 years ago, the food that you ate grew within 100 miles of you. Now I can go into Wegmans, and I can buy stuff flown in the day before from all over the world. This is a huge change. If you change the food available to a species 1,000 years ago, a million years ago, anywhere on the planet, you can predict changes in behavior and social structure, nutrition, and body adaptations. This change is huge. It's just one of dozens. We used to walk. 100 years ago, the primary mode was walking. A little bit of horseback riding, occasional car or train. Now, I don't know if you can see the Segway pushing the scooter, but it was the best way I could find to kind of imply that most of the time we drive now. Walking is so rare that we count our steps, right? This is a big change. For the entire scope of the arc of human evolution, our tools were physical. We could debate about books as a, as, a, as a theoretical or symbolic, but now no one will debate that in the last 10 years, most of our tools are digital. This has huge implications. It's not about how we move our body anymore. It's how we move our eyes, what we draw our attention to. And the adaptations uh, that happen at a neurological level are different when it's all in our head and it's all on a screen versus physical. For the entire scope of human history, we've lived in small populations, 150 or less. To put that in perspective, up until 200 years ago, most people lived in rural settings. But in the last 200 years, we went from 5% of people living in cities to over 70% here in America. That's a huge change in terms of social structures and the implications for that. And then just last one of these, uh, physical. You know, Men have grown 3 inches, 30 pounds, and have gained 30, uh, 30 years of average life expectancy in just the last few years. These are just five examples from dozens of things that we've changed all at once. So what I want to know is the world that my daughters are going to grow up in going to be a little bit different than the one that I grew up in. I step back and I go, holy, it's going to be very different. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Bipedalism, you know, the, uh, the ability to walk on two feet, is a major change because it unlocked the ability to use our hands as tools. That's what most people will point to. It's a simple story. But what most people don't look at is the fact that bipedalism arose during a period of climate change. The Earth had been relatively uh, stable for three or four million years, but then it began to oscillate. And it was at that point that our early ancestors began to walk. And they were able to leave behind hunting and gathering areas that our quadrupedal, four-legged ancestors were in and find out new sources of food and resources and mates. But, and this is a greatly simplified graph, the Earth started to gradually cool and went through periods of, of climate change, not related to man, um, that co-evolved at the same time that we developed cooperative hunting. Cooperative hunting seems like a really simple thing, but we're one of the few species on Earth that does it. There's a lot of things that have to go on in the brain and the social structure to support that. Then the Earth started to warm up again. Again, this is a very simplified model. But in 5,000 years, the Earth warmed by 5 degrees. And it was during this period that the oceans rose. Humans moved from our rich hunting grounds near the coast up into the hills. They discovered a few grains and thus became agriculture. And civilization has never been the same, all because of climate change. 5,000 years, 5 degrees. But between 1900 and 2100, the buttons the Earth is going to ri rise in temperature five degrees. 
This isn't a prediction, and I'm not judging anthropogenic climate change. I'm saying this is factual. If you read back through the actual temperature in 1900 now and extrapolate that according to current scientific trends, five degrees. So is the world that my children are going to grow up in and you, with your greatly extended lifespans, are going to live in going to be dramatically different than the world from the past? I think it will be. So we've talked enough about the past. Let me tell you a little bit about the emergent brain. This is the title of the writing project that I'm, I'm working on, but it's also the model. The emergent brain is this three-part model. The brain, of course, and the body that houses the brain. And that's great. It keeps it safe, it moves it around, it feeds it, it nourishes it. And that's important because the brain is an expensive tissue for the body to support. It takes 20% of the energy that the body produces to take care of the brain, whether you're awake or asleep. But I've co-adopted, or I've co-opted a term from a guy by the name of Ben Husted called exocortex to refer to all the information around us to which we are now outsourcing our brain. I used to laugh when I heard that most people under 30 don't know the phone number to their significant other. But then I went and got cell phones for my daughters, and I don't know their phone number. Okay. So we are taking basic thought process and memories and storing them in the cloud. We don't need to know them anymore. Siri, how many cups in a gallon? When I practiced the speech the other day, Siri answered to me from the other room, 16. And I had to think, and I realized she was right. So we don't have to park our car anymore, some of us. And not just our kids, but maybe even some of us aren't going to have to worry about how to drive anymore. We're not, we don't have to. And that's good. This three-part model means there's less toll on the brain as we've outsourced to technology around us. And since the brain is an expensive tissue to support, this is a good thing. We perform better with less resources. But here's the question. Can anybody read that? What will you do with your brain when everything it used to do is being done better by technology? That's the question I'm working on. So you've probably all seen Elon Musk has announced significant investment, Neuralink, about directly connecting artificial intelligence to the brain. I mean, directly and physically. So we've talked about the past. Now I'm talking about the present, not the future. He's going to create Siri jacked right into your brain. This isn't science fiction. This is real. This is current news. So I had a chance to talk to one of his peers, a founder of a major technology company. He has also gone on to found two of the leading institutes for the studies of future in artificial intelligence. And I said, hey, am I crazy here? I mean, to me, this looks like not just extrapolating technology, life's going to get busier and more hectic, but if I go back through this past literature, life is going to be fundamentally different. And I said, I don't think anybody's working on this. He goes, Pat, you're absolutely right. There's no question. It's going to be dramatically different. And he says, I know everybody in the fields. No one's working on it. He goes, but that's a short-term problem. Artificial intelligence is going to be such a game changer that what you're talking about pales in comparison. So I get off the phone and I'm thinking about this. 99.9% .9 of us aren't thinking about the future. We, we are. We know it's going to be a little bit busier. Life's a little bit hectic. Oh, time to go get the kids from soccer. But those few people that are are thinking 30 years out, how do we get between here and there? What I'm asking you to do is consider for a minute that my premise that things are going to be very different is true. And their premise, that the world is so different that the state of humanity is a short-term problem. How do you navigate between the two of these? So a couple months ago, um, I held a seminar going over these same issues. Because frankly, I'm starting to think I'm a little crazy. So are others. <laughs> so I bring neuroscientists, medical doctors, top technologists, national defense experts, moms, dads, a broad spectrum of group of people, and I present this research in a lot deeper depth than I'm, I'm here. And I ask them the same questions. Am I crazy? Do you believe this evidence indicates that things may be dramatically different? And if it is, who's working on this? Or should we even be working on it? And they all said the same thing as the artificial intelligence guy. Is this a real problem? It's a huge problem, but no one's working on it. And interestingly, out of that conversation, not a single person in the room felt qualified to address the question. The guy with an MD, a PhD in psychiatry, who was the chief technology officer of a technology company, says he's not qualified to address the question. There's an optimistic end to this story, though. 
we found that with all of our different backgrounds, we could begin to compare notes using different thought process, methodologies, and evidence. And the problem was tractable, solvable, that if enough of us got together, we could sort of figure this out. From that, we got the idea to start an organization that you'll uh, hopefully hear about here soon, the Emergent Brain Consortium, a global consortium of experts from multiple difference. And they don't have to be experts. These are people who care. Someone's like, oh, you're creating an elitist organization. No, we're crowdsourcing the answers to the future of humanity. We're not saying technology is bad. I might be a little bit of a Luddite, but that's just because I'm an idiot uh, about using basic technologies. But I like technology. I think technology can be used to make things better. So we did not need technology to navigate the agricultural revolution. We didn't need it for the industrial revolution. Why do we need a global consortium of experts or people crowdsourcing the future of this information age? And that's because, first of all, the change is going to be much faster and much bigger than those previous two. And we have the tools. So this consortium will work to create internet collaboration tools, much like other, other organizations that are out there, but also in person. This is about human intelligence, not just technology, bringing people together in seminars around the world, collaborating. What are the answers that we come up with? I'm not sure. But I do know that this is an important problem, and we're going to begin to chip away at it using technology, using people to uh, address the problem. So we've gone on a little adventure now. I started out by changing your, slot, your brain with a single slide. Now I've changed it maybe a little bit more with about another 18. To what end, right? I've just given you a huge, complicated problem that faces the future of mankind. How is it relevant to you guys? Well, I think we can, bite, we can eat this elephant one bite at a time. The first thing is, each of us individually now, I hope you'll pause some time and think about the technology that you consume and adopt. This is not about screen time. Everybody wants me to reduce this down to screen time and dopamine. You download an app to your phone. It eliminates the need to remember what kind of groceries you need. Great. You don't have to worry about that all day long. What do you do with the mental resources freed up with that? Do you use those mental resources, that 30 seconds of thinking, five minutes of, of, remem of memory, to make your life happier, more productive, healthier? Or do you cram more stuff in there that does just the opposite? If your job has been eliminated by an algorithm, that can do your job better than you can, you can go home and whine about it, watch the Kardashians complain on social media. What's wrong with the Kardashians? <laughs> I didn't know this was an interactive audience. <laughs> but you could also go and apply your brain to things that computers can't do now or in the future. The problem is, is the roadmap's missing. You know what foods to eat. But how do I raise my kids? How do I use my extra brain cycles that technology has given me? What do I do if my job's getting outsourced? What should I train myself for? That's missing. And that's what I hope that organizations like the Emergent Brain Consortium will begin to chip away at. But the second part of what I wanted to bring to you is exactly that. Oh, this is the first part. You literally create your own experience about what you pay attention to, and what technologies you consume and focus on. But collectively, there's people here in the room that make technology. There's people here in the room that run or take part in organizations that use technology. There's people here in the room that are part of families. Sitting down at the boardroom, sitting down at the dining table, beginning to ask these questions to take the responsibility to kind of start to dictate what the future might hold, that's the second thing I wanted to impart on you guys today. That's a unique opportunity. The two things we haven't talked about about human cognition is two traits that humans have in spades. One, the ability to anticipate and the ability to adapt. If you guys have heard this and I've changed your brain a little bit and you begin to ask these questions, maybe you too will start to find opportunities to anticipate what the future is going to have and adapt how we use technology, harness technology, but also harness the humanity to leave this place better for us and for our kids.